Um, I always like to start with uh, something uh, kind of uh, off of the uh, topic that, I, that uh, I'm going to be talking about. This is a picture of, uh, a, a, it is a photograph that I actually took <clears throat> on the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Suzanne and I were sitting with her sister and brother-in-law uh, and on the, on the deck, uh, on the balcony, looking at the sunset. And I said, this is so beautiful. I'm going to go, I, I grabbed my camera, I came out and I took a picture of the sun setting. Has anybody ever heard of the green flash? Well, Google it up. Um, as the sun sets just below the horizon, and, 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 and you can't see any of the, the roundness of the sun anymore, all of the colors of the rainbow are washed out except for green. And it, and it lasts for about a second and a half, maybe two seconds. Um, and I had sailed for 40 something years. I've been on a number of, of different bodies of water. And sitting there, um, I, I was able to see the green flash. And it, it's something that is absolutely uh, uh, exhilarating when, when you finally get to see something like that. I looked over to then, and brother-in-law did not see it, but her sister and I did. Um, and, and so I am now part of the Green Flash Club. You can Google it up. It's a, it's a good thing to see. Um, introduce myself real quick. Uh, George Kraft, for those of you who don't know me. I was a professor uh, in California psychology at Fulton University for 20 years. I left, uh, walked away from tenure, uh, went with the Norfolk Community Services Board and worked with uh, the Services Board there for 22 years. I retired from that, was invited to come back to ODU uh, and, and teach uh, treatment of addictive disorders, how to, how to deal with people and supervise the PhD candidates. So I um, have a long background. Um, uh, working with seriously mentally ill, seriously addicted people, done forensic work, um, and and it's really an educator of my heart. It's just I love learning and I love uh, uh, continuing to to help people understand. Okay, next. Uh, one of the things to uh, uh, that I always like to do um, I, is, is start off with a a, a, a a large understanding of who we are as people. And I put this together a number of years ago and, and have used it quite often. Um, we operate in a number of different domains. Um, and, 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 and I'll just run through these quickly. Our, our affective domain is, is, is uh, our feelings, their emotions. Um, we have a cognitive domain, which is, which is our thinking, you know, what goes on in our when we try to solve problems and understand things. Uh, obviously, we are social creatures, and in this part and in our world, we also, most people have vocations or jobs or activities. Um, down at the bottom is our um, theological or religious domain. Um, somebody said they're not getting good audio. Turn it up as far as you can. Um, no, there's not. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't, can't but, uh, There's our physiological domain. I'll try to talk a little louder. Is that that's going to help? Physiological domain is uh, you know all of our biological activity. Behavioral domain is just that. It's, it's, it's how our actions and that sort of thing. And here's the important thing: issues that develop in any domain affect all the other domains. So let me give you an example. Um, in a behavioral domain, an individual could get in, could uh, be in an extremely traumatic uh, situation, create something called post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, as a result of that, it affects our affective domain, <clears throat> and uh, we feel anxious, uh, we don't trust, and that sort of thing. And it affects the cognitive domain. We always think that something is going to be happening. Uh, some kind of tragedy. We re, uh, uh, withdraw from social and vocational activities. Um, we often uh, blame God for what we were doing. And so all of these different domains uh, can affect each other. My area of training and learning and activities is in the cognitive and behavioral domain. 
that, that's how we, where we learn. And we, we know a lot more about how we learn than how we feel, uh, even our physiological domain. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight is the cognitive and behavioral domain. Next. And what I want to do is go over some general givens that people don't understand. Next slide. Uh, the general given. Uh, first of all, we're not going to be talking about addiction. Uh, there's a difference between habit, which is developed through repetition, and addiction, which is defined by doing something where you develop a tolerance to it and becomes dependency. And once you develop tolerance and you're dependent on it, if you quit doing it, there's withdrawal. We rarely see withdrawal out of a habit. You can be unhappy, but it's not a, a physiological issue. So I'm not going to be talking about addiction. That's a totally different approach uh, to, to dealing, dealing with that. Make sense? Okay. Um, so here's some givens. Our brain never sleeps, and it's always working for us. When you go to sleep, your body goes to sleep, your brain is actually actually shutting down uh, certain areas of of, uh, of, of the body that uh, allow you to uh, move and and, uh, and and dream and those kind of things. But but your brain is working all night long, uh, almost as much as it does during the day. The brain waves are different, and the activities that are going on in your brain are different. But it's still working. Um, so it never sleeps. The next one, we, we like to think that we're in control of our brain, but the truth is that the vast majority of what we do is accomplished even without thinking about it. Think how much, how much trouble it would be if in order to, uh, uh, when you get up in the morning and you want to uh, brush your teeth, think how difficult it would be if you had to get, get say, left foot on the floor, right foot on the floor, left foot, right foot into the bathroom, uh, toothpaste on the, uh, on the toothbrush, turn it on, that sort of thing. We do that stuff automatically. Think about when you walk out of uh, your house and you go to your car. You don't have to go through a thought process of get the key, put it in the door, put it in the ignition, all those turn it on, that sort of thing. We, we, don't, we don't have to do that. There's actually not enough brain cells up there to have to think through. The truth is probably 90% of everything that we do, we do automatically. Uh, I don't like to use the word unconscious because that's a whole different theoretical orientation, but, but we do it automatically. We, we just, we don't have enough brain cells to go through that, the process all the time. It's a really interesting study for people who have had some brain injury from stroke or, or accident of some type, and they actually have to do that. They have to talk themselves through the processes of, of uh, pick, uh, get your fork, put it in the food, put it in your mouth, you actually have to think through it. Okay, the next one. Even when we think we're, act, we're acting, not yet, <laughs> even when we think back, even when we think we're acting by free choice, often our brain has made the decision before we consciously do it. That's why and how habits are formed. They're, they're formed when you repeat things over and over and over again without uh, thinking about it or remembering it. Our brain doesn't like conflict. I'm going to come back to that one. Our brain is going, does not like conflict or unpleasant. That's called dissonance or cognitive dissonance. And we'll try to explain things mostly without us ever realizing. I'll come back to that later on in one of the slides. But it's really important to understand that given a default, our brain is going to choose things that that it, that we like or things that are pleasant as opposed to things that are unpleasant. Our brain is developed to make immediate decisions often saving our lives. And that's a good thing. You know, 
if, uh, if somebody pulls in front of you and slams on brakes, if you had to stop and think about right left foot on the brake, right foot off the accelerator, you would be in their trunk right there. It happened so fast. Does that, that make sense? Um, I want to do something, and uh, uh, Valena, I can see some people, so that's fine. We don't need to go. Either. I want to play a game uh, of Simon Says. Everybody remember Simon Says? Not yet. Okay, Simon Says. Okay. Okay, here it is. Simon Says, raise your left hand. Put it down. Several of you flinched. I saw you move. Simon says, put it down. <laughs> but I saw several people go, go ahead and move. And what happens is your brain is saying, this is an awkward position. It is uncomfortable. Um, I don't like it. And so I'm going to put it down. As soon as I get a cue of any kind, put it down. Uh, Belina and I went through this earlier. And she held it up, but I saw her flinch. It's that difference between what the brain is actually wanting to do and what your cognition is telling you to do. Make sense? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, our brain is developed to make basic decisions such as finding food uh, for energy, deciding what to, uh, what to eat, um, uh, what, when to rest, who to love, and who to accept. This is absolutely so important because we, we, are, we have developed to do certain things based on not having to think about it, uh, immediate kinds of responses. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, our brain is, has, has developed to make decisions about finding food for energy. Um, 2,000 years ago, the sweetest things on earth were dates and honey, dates and honey. Now we have sweeteners that are a thousand times sweeter than sugar. And I, I forgot the amount of sugar that every person in the, in, in the United States eats each year, but it's outstanding. And our brain says, I love it, but our body says we can't handle it. Okay, that's going to be important in a, uh, with the next one. Knowing something rarely helps to change behavior. We know we should not be eating this much sugar. Does anybody know, uh, has anybody's doctor said to them or their spouse, you need to get more exercise, right? Or uh, 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 you need to put on, on a, on a, on a, 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 a heavier sweater to go outside. There are things that we know, but it rarely changes what it is that we do. Something else is doing that. And it's our brain that is actually making that decision, even though we know we need to do something else. Here's the, the driving point of all of these pivots. Trying harder to do something rarely works. You must always have to do something else. Learn a new way of doing it. You're never going to change a habit just by working harder. Think about if, if you were a musician or a uh, sports person um, or, or a guitar player. You can try harder and harder and harder and harder to do the right thing. But if your skills are bad, it's not going to make it any better. Trying harder almost never works. Next. Okay. Most habits follow very simple rules. This is the rule. If you took psychology 101, this is uh, uh, the stuff that Skinner and a number of other. There have been millions of studies looking at simple learning. And basically, it follows a simple format. And that is there's a stimulus, something says do something, there's a response and a consequence as a result of that. And that consequence is either going to pay off, it's going to be rewarded, or it's going to be a punishment. In other words, you don't 
life. In other words, there's a cue and an act and a response. All right. One of the really interesting things is I've worked with, with people before um, who say uh, typically it's about arguing. And they say, I really hate arguing. I really hate it. So there's a stimulus where they get into where it says, you need to, to say something. And then your response is to argue. And the consequence of that is you either feel good or you don't. And so I say to people, why do you keep doing it? So I don't really know. By definition, if you keep doing something, it has to be a reward. Think about that. If it's not a reward, then it's a punishment. And if it's punishment, don't stop it. Um, so think about a habit and say, well, I hate this habit. You know, if you keep doing it, it's because the consequence is rewarding. So that's something to really think about when we're going to talk about some steps to go through in a minute. But that's really important to think about. If you keep doing it, it's got to be rewarding. And it's important to try to figure out what that reward is. The way most people try to deal with habit is, and you go through the stimulus response and consequence. Yeah. Uh, try to, uh, they try to change the stimulus by saying, I'm just going to avoid that situation. I don't like that situation. I'm going to avoid that situation. It rarely helps. Uh, another thing they say is, I just won't give in next time. I'll just not do it. Like uh, fingernail biting. Uh, that's not a real addiction. Uh, that, that is a habit of some kind. Uh, I've worked with a number of people. It's an extremely hard habit to change, but um, at the end, I'm going to give you a, a really interesting uh, technique you can use, and I've had incredible success with it. Um, one of the biggest problems with uh, fingernail biting or picking is that it's, it's really difficult to identify the stimulus or the reward. But if you keep going, there has to be a reward to it. So people say, well, I just won't give in next time. Extremely hard to give that up. Um, and then try to change the consequence. <laughs> I'll just not like it anymore. So, uh, uh, you know, if, you, if it's cookies, I, 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 my habit is that I eat too many cookies. Cookies taste good. It is really hard to say I'm not going to like cookies or chocolate or uh, biting my finger. Um, and all three of these stimulus, response, and consequence are, are influenced by our past experiences, present, and the future as we believe things are going to be occurring. Uh, Belaine, I'm going to come back to this uh, in a minute. Go to the next one. Uh, remember I said that uh, uh, our, our habits are, are influenced by, uh, by things from the past or the present or the future. Um, just wanted to touch on some, and there are hundreds of these things. But uh, one is unconscious bias. We have a habit of uh, choosing to be around and like people who are like us. Um, an infant is able to identify the mother's face within, uh, you know, several hours after birth. Um, and some really fascinating studies have been done about um, how early we end up developing this bias for our kind, our, our family, people with our traits, people that look like us. Um, there, there's some really interesting uh, out, uh, out there uh, about unconscious bias between racial groups. That doesn't mean we can't overcome it, but the way we overcome it is to become aware of it. And the way we become aware of it is to uh, be around other people uh, who are unlike us and then question how or what are we thinking about this? Am I uncomfortable? Why am I uncomfortable? Does that make sense? 
the, the, this un, unconscious bias. We have an unconscious bias toward certain kinds of foods, particularly high sugar foods, high carbohydrate foods. Um, that's brain function. We don't even think about it. It, it, is, it is in our, our basic makeup to, uh, to have that the kind of bias. The next one, warm and cold drink bias. <laughs> so there's some uh, um, professors who started, I'll talk about the, the next one, the behavioral economic, economics in a minute, but they, they ran some studies where they gave the very same lecture on, uh, on economics, uh, introduction to economics, and they gave people uh, a warm drink like coffee, or tea and tea, or cold drinks like sodas and uh, iced tea or iced water. And then they evaluated, uh, uh, they looked at the evaluations of the, uh, of the class itself. The people who had give, been given warm drinks were much more likely to evaluate the, uh, the class as being outstanding. So I hope all of you have uh, a warm drink. Bob, do you have a warm drink with you tonight? I hope. Okay, good, good. Because I want you to really like what it is that I'm saying tonight. Um, interestingly, uh, marketing uh, folks have picked this up. And a number of, uh, of, peop of, mar of furniture stores and stores with uh, sell mattresses, uh, when they go in, they will offer you a nice warm drink. Uh, instead of a cold drink, uh, even in the summertime, th this works. This this study has been replicated a number of times. Now, where does that come from? It comes from the reaction of the brain itself. We're not thinking about that. It's done automatically unconsciously. Um, two gentlemen, uh, one from MIT and one from Harvard, I believe, uh, won the Nobel Prize for Economics about ten years ago. They come up with something called behavioral economics. And basically what they're saying is the old Keynesian, Keynesian uh, theory of economics, the simple demand and supply, uh, leaves out the most important part of buying, uh, and that influence buying, that's the human cycle. Um, one of the things that, that they did was they took um, the very uh, products I think it was television set that cost exactly the same. They had the same insides to it. Uh, and one of them was the low price, one was the high price, and then they had a midpoint. And it was the midpoint that always sold the most. I mean, who's going to go out and say, I'm going to buy the cheapest? Well, no, <laughs> I do. Uh, a number of people go out <laughs> and they, they'll say, I'm going to buy the cheapest one I can get. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Consumer Reports is really great about that is reporting um, what what is really the best value that you that you can possibly get. But as human beings, we almost always look at the mid the mid point, and often that's the one that the marketers want us to get, as opposed to the one that we really Really um, study, many studies have been done about don't go uh, to the grocery store when you're hungry. The cost goes up almost 20% uh, of, of what you would normally buy. If you get off work and you go stop by the store and you've got that uh, rotisserie chicken that is just walking out at you, you know, and it's wonderful and you say, well, I was going to go home and cook, but now I've got to go this week. Um, so uh, uh, it, it's just a, a, amazing the, uh, the, the uh, amount of, uh, of influence that our brain will send us toward by uh, when we go into uh, to buy something when we're hungry. Uh, and the final one is, and I went through that. I, I am amazed when I go into the store. I was at the, a grocery store today. Um, usually, the um, uh, in, the things they want you to buy are uh, around the edges, the 
because you start and when you go in, there's also the meat counter right over there. That's beautiful, you know, roast beef and all that sort of thing. Um, and, and then the cereals and things like that are in a certain area that you are actually um, um, shunted into as you're buying. I was at a, uh, a store on 21st Street uh, today and uh, all of the food and all is around the outside. And then you have to go check out. And as you're in the checkout lane, there's always people backed up there. There's all this, uh, uh, all these things that you would not normally buy that are in that. And you're stuck there. And you cannot get through that without looking around at everything. And invariably, I'm buying a specialty kind of, of spice or something like that that I'll use one time or whatever. Um, and then just as you get to the checkout, what's there? What's there is gum and candy and cookies and those kinds, right? That's done by study. Psychologists have helped grocery stores study where to put their merchandise to, to, uh, to, to get the, the most sales out of it. Now, okay, next slide. Now, now, why that is important, next slide, okay. So what can we do uh, around, um, around the, these kinds of situations? Well, the first thing we need to do is gather as much information as we can. The more we know about how other people who study these kinds of things are trying to influence our behavior, the better off we are. Study, gather information about what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, reflect, uh, focus on reflection. Think about it. If you have a habit of some kind, um, what is it you really want? What do you, what do you really want to do as a result of it? Is it okay that you eat a cookie every night? Is it okay that you have a bowl of ice cream every night, huh? Um, <laughs> I don't know. But, but think, it's really important to think about what we're doing. And then one of the things that we know without any shadow of a doubt is if we write, if we record what it is that we're doing, we can increase our outcome by about 30% uh, by writing in a journal uh, or, 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 or writing it down in other places or developing a chart. I can't. I can't tell you the number of people I have worked with um, that that I've been able to do a mood chart um, to, to uh, record how they're feeling throughout uh, a week or three weeks or something like that. Charting is, is really very, very help, helpful. And then to record when and where and how this is occurring. And then we often have to visit more and more and more. Do something other than trying harder. Uh, you are in control uh, of, of what it is that you are doing as long as you know what is influencing you and you've got all of the information. Uh, Galena, go back to the uh, um, stimulus and response. Okay, now keep going. Go back. There, there, no. Okay, I want to talk about this. Um, just to give you some examples of some things that, that we can do. Uh, and then I'm going to finish up with a really interesting approach that will give us enough time to, uh, to ask some questions. Um, one of the things that people try to, like I said, try to do is try to change the stimulus. And I'm going to avoid, I'm just going to avoid that situation. Um, I had a... Uh, um, was working with somebody very very in, in class and they said <clears throat> that um, that every night before they go to bed they have a habit of e eating a bowl of ice cream and they 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 had put on some weight and they, they wanted to stop uh, to, to break that habit of eating ice cream every night before they went to bed and sometimes things just see, you know, we like to think about human behavior as being so incredibly complicated. And some of it is, but, but most of it is not. And so I looked at him and I said, I have an idea. 
He said, what? And I said, don't buy any more ice cream. You know, it doesn't grow in the refrigerator. And they said, what? But will I go to sleep? And I said, well, sure you'll go to sleep. Your, your habit is eating ice cream, not going to sleep. Um, and next week they came back after the class and said, I can't believe it. It worked. And I said, well, of course it'll work. It's so simple. You know, cookies don't grow in the cabinet. If you don't have cookies, you're not going to snack on them. You know, you know, and they said, well, if, if I can't go to sleep, have an apple. That's a heck of a lot better for you than cookies. You know, some things about human behavior are just really very simple. But we don't think about it because we don't sit there and analyze what we're doing. Um, persons, uh, they're, they're going to change their response. Uh, I just won't I just won't give in next time. That never works. It, it, it just won't work. You either got to change the stimulus or the consequence, one or the other. Uh, the last one is to change the consequence. And uh, th this one... Uh, I actually applied to myself as a result of a small group of, of, the, of, of the church that we, we, uh, we read this book called uh, uh, Unoffendable, which I thought the title was kind of stupid, uh, but it was actually pretty interesting uh, the way that it was presented in it. And it got me thinking, I, I had this, I've had this bad uh, habit um, and I'm sure that some of you have as well. When, um, and, and it seems that uh, the Tidewater area is just notorious about people cutting in in front of you in, a, in the lane when you're going, you know, going down to Bramble, Brambleton or 64 or whatever. If you get any kind of space there, somebody's going to cut in front of you, right? That, and I would blow my horn and I would just get really upset uh, at it. And I'd say some things that I probably shouldn't say. And after the small group that we had, I started thinking about it. And I said, you know, this is not changing the other person at all. This, this is causing me problems, not the other person. And so then and I were coming somewhere down near Scope, I think it was. Somebody cut in front of me. And I said, you know, I'll bet that's an orthopedic surgeon on their way to North of General Hospital to, uh, because there's been a horrible automobile accident and they've got to get there to save somebody's life. And we started laughing about it. And, and we have practiced this more and more. And one of the things that has done is just change this anger, this hostility, that was upsetting me to joy and happy and laughter and that sort of thing. Um, so we can change our consequence to habit. Now, um, what I want is the habit so that I keep saying that over and over again. This makes sense. I hope it does. But you can't, you almost never change the response, but you can change the stimulus, which is the situation that sets it up and you can change the consequence of what you're doing. Okay, go back. Next slide, down, forward, forward. Okay, so back to that, that one. This is a technique that I actually developed and have found to be unbelievably effective. It looks like that it, uh, it, it just seems so simple um, but, but I've used it probably a hundred times. Um, and, and basically what you're doing is you're creating a cognitive dissonance. Remember your brain does not like dissonance. It does not like where things are, where things don't make sense. Um, so the first thing is to identify the hat. Let me give you an example. Um, um, it could be, um, uh, Cursing, uh, okay, uh, a cursing habit. I actually did this in the last, uh, in the class that I presented, and somebody uh, came to me afterwards and said, uh, I don't see how this thing works. And I said, give it a try. 
and it came back the next week and you said you're a miracle worker. And I said, no, no, this is just simple stuff. It's not me. You did it to your own brain. Uh, so the next thing is to identify how often it occurs. Is it 10 times a day? Whatever. Identify the reasons that you would like to change. In other words, what is it that you would, how come it is that you want to change this thing? Um, it could be that I offend when this occurs. Um, then find a verbal message about your reason to change. That is a verbal message would be that it offends people when I curse. And then find a way for the message to be presented at a higher frequency than the habit itself, such as presenting it on your Facebook page of your phone or your computer. You actually write out your message that cursing offends people. And then every time you look at your phone or your computer, that message is there at a higher frequency than what it is that you were doing. Um, and then when you see it, you actually have to actually say it because when you say something, um, and it's best if you can say it out loud, but you, if you're in a, in a conference or something, you don't want to say it out loud, say it in your brain, run it over. You can't just look at it. You actually have to say it. It actually um, uh, activates behavioral areas of your brain as if you were, your mouth was moving. And this creates a cognitive dissonance. Your brain does not like this. And so one message has to win out. One of them has to win. You either quit doing it or the, the message of cursing against people has to win out. I, I did this uh, to quit smoking. I love smoking. It's way back in the 70s. I love it. Pack Marlboro did. Um, and in 48 hours, I quit smoking. Uh, um, and in uh, four days, I quit wanting to smoke. Um, and um, nicotine washes out of your body very quickly. So it, it's both a, a, an addiction and a habit. But 80% of all the smoking is a habit, you know, doing something with your hands. And, that sort of thing. and I've never wanted to smoke again since then. Um, I've, I've had people say, I tried it and it worked and I quit the project because I really wanted to smoke. Well, I can't do anything, but if you apply it, it has to work. Uh, um, this makes, uh, I mean, this really works. <laughs> it looks so simple, but it really does work. Next, Next slide. Um, this is some, some of my own beliefs and, and well, beliefs of others as well. But we are unbelievable, incredible creatures. Uh, the human, human being is such an unbelievable, wondrous, wondrous uh, uh, animal. Uh, but we're only as free as we know what is actually concerned. If we are unaware, if we choose to be unaware of the things past, present, and our future ideas, if we are, we, we choose to be unaware of those things, we're at the mercy of, of our own brain, as well as the mercy of other people, like grocery stores, and for big time and fun, fun Are you going to let them control your own behavior, or are you going to take on the responsibility of understanding what it is that we can do for ourselves. Becoming the goodness in us by opening up our understanding of what it is that we can do and take responsibility for this. Becoming what we really can be. We are unbelievable creatures uh, and we can do so many, so many things for good. Um, Paul said, all things work together for good. I absolutely but added to it, if we only know what it is and what, know how to do it. Um, and, and one of the things that I, that idea that I, I developed 
very early in my professional career was, if we know all of these kinds of things that influence us, if we know a number of things that influence us, and if we know how to change our own behavior, um, why do we wait until we have a problem? Why don't we do things before they become a problem? Or at least once they get a problem, teach people the skills that they can take out. Teach them to fish, uh, as opposed to just continuing to fish. And so I, 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 I fully believe that we have uh, only begun to, understand, to, to develop the skills of self-control. Self-control is not, is not a, a construct. It is a set of skills. And we can learn to, uh, to develop those skills through some of the things that I've talked about. Last, last slide. Here's some books you may be interested in, uh, in reading. Uh, before you know it, and this is uh, talked about, uh, some of these books were in the church library. Um, uh, before you know it is about how fast your brain is working and how it influences your decisions, uh, particularly around uh, unconscious bias. Uh, I love this one, Predictably Irrational. It is in the Morgan Library. It, it is about how uh, basically irrational our decisions are because we are unaware of the influences upon us. The power of habit um, is uh, has a lot of what I've talked about tonight. Uh, Switched on your brain, fascinating book about uh, um, how uh, things external to us actually influence our brain altogether. And any work by Paul Perry was um, fascinating psychologist uh, with well, a tremendous amount of work on how we are, are influenced and what we can do about those kinds of things. I hope this has been helpful. I hope it's been interesting and I will entertain questions because we have 10 minutes or so. And if nobody has questions, <laughs> nobody. Okay. Um, I. I did not see questions in the chat box. So if you guys have questions, if you could put them in the chat box. Um, and while I wait for those, I would, George, love for you to talk a little bit about um, what kind of habits have you seen other people stop? Oh, gosh, uh, you name it. Uh, um, I have, I mean, I've been in this business, well, since I got my doctorate in the <laughs> mid 70s, I have worked with hundreds of people, um, nail biting, cursing, um, uh, eating behavior, weight loss, uh, um, you name it. Uh, one of the things that we used to do very early before I came up with the idea of, of putting a message on your, on your screen um, was we would take people and, and, and have them put notes on their refrigerator uh, uh, or a picture of themselves that they don't particularly like. The problem with that is if you put a picture of yourself overweight uh, or in a swimsuit, uh, that can be pretty punishing. <laughs> and if it's punishing, you're going to quit doing it. So what you need to do is do something that you can't that you, you have to trick your brain so, so that you can't get away from that that picture. One of the things that people used to do was to, uh, um, if they wanted to break a habit of some kind, they would put a rubber band around their wrist and they would snap it every time they would want to make the response, whether it be go get a cookie or a cigarette or something like that. They would uh, snap it on their wrist. Well, that's very punishing. So you're not going to keep that up. That will stop. Awesome. So I've got a question here, um, George, from Bob Batcher. He's oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he said, at the end, just before the books, you said self-control is a set of skills. What did you say it is not? <sighs> there, there are... There is, there, oh gosh, there used to be a, 
an area of psychology called trait factor psychology. And the idea was, I like this one. The idea was that there are certain traits that people have. Uh, and one of them was that people have the trait to be able to control uh, themselves, to be uh, uh, more mindful, uh, just, just uh, biologically. And I don't believe that. I think that self-control is a set of skills, uh, like applying learning principles to uh, to things that, that happen to you, like me saying, if a guy pulls in front of me, I can make something humorous out of it, as opposed to trying to make it a response to the event itself. I can apply skills. And, and, and their skills of, of, of patience, counting to 10. Uh, their skills of, uh, of understanding things by writing it down and charting it, things like that. And, and so as opposed to being a trait of some kind, I think that self-control is actually a set of skills that we can teach people, particularly kids. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, it, and, it, and it's a shame that we don't identify more self-controlled skills and teach it to kids as early as we possibly can. Does Diane, I see your question. Lena, you want to read it? Yeah, uh, so the question is from Diane Liebman, any thoughts about using hypnosis to break habits? It's really fascinating. Uh, hypnosis is, uh, is kind of a, uh, a controversial issue. Um, clearly, hypnosis helps people uh, with habits. Um, and I know some people who have had hypnosis and and have, have broken their habit, uh, but long, longitudinal studies tend to show that that hypnosis is more of a uh, temporary fix, and that people have to go back uh, at times. But there are people, people listening here that I've talked to, <clears throat> who have uh, had hypnosis and have met the habit has gone gone away. Completely. It, hypnosis is really not that mystical. It, it puts a person into a, uh, the accepted idea. It, it, it puts a person into a, a state of, of uh, increased suggestibility. Um, but, uh, and, and, and so it can work. Yes, it, it certainly makes people feel better. Um, but the, the studies indicate that booster shots of it over time. And, and so my idea is if we teach people the skill of breaking habit, then uh, and understanding habit formation and that sort of thing. And by the way, breaking the habit can be used, uh, the techniques can be used to build that. If you want to build a habit of reading your Bible every night, you do the same thing. There's a stimulus. The response is reading your Bible, and there's a consequence, and that consequence needs to be pleasurable. If, if it's a boring passage, you need to follow it by something that's positive and rewarding, uh, whatever it might be, and it, and it could be the feeling of understanding, of, of serenity, the feeling of talking to God. Uh, but but, if, but it, it, if you've got to read the genealogy of it, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty tough. <laughs> Anybody else? Nobody. Put everybody to sleep. <laughs> I don't think you've put anyone to sleep, George. This is really helpful information. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, you know, tricking your brain, how to trick your brain. 
Um, and what other ways we could we could do that? Wow, that, that that's a, that's that, that's another class. <laughs> uh, uh, the important thing in breaking a habit is to the the way I I that that last slide using my technique is to create a discipline. Uh, and your brain does not like this. It doesn't like discord. Uh, it does not like conflicting situations. And so what you have to do is create that situation where you can't, where your brain can't make you escape it because it'll want to do that. Um, the brain likes sugar. <laughs> you know, it does. So we've got to create something where your message overpowers that natural um, environment in your brain to want sugars. Um, it, it's interesting that uh, uh, there's a lot of, there is controversy as to whether or not sugar can be addictive. Um, I frankly think that it can be, uh, but we don't have a, all the research that we need around, around it at this point. Other ways of tricking your brain is to listen to uh, uh, soothing music at, at when you're uh, in an anxious situation. Uh, uh, aromatherapy is, is another one. Yoga, where, where you train yourself to, uh, or, or mindfulness, or prayer, where you can overpower your brain, your net brain's natural tendency to do certain things. And, you, and, and there, there are just numerous ways that we can actually trick our brain to move in. The, but the important thing is that you've got to know what your goal is. You got, you have to know where you want to go and the, uh, go with it. Uh, and, and what's the stimulus? What is your response? You do that through charting, and monitoring, all those kinds of things. And then create uh, the, whatever the trick is that you want. What, I'll give you an example. One of the things in, in the uh, book on uh, how to trick the brain, the people that des designed the breeze, um, the air freshener, it's not an air freshener. It was not originally an air freshener. The gentleman that uh, was the chemist came and he was a smoker and he came home one day and his wife said, honey, I'm so happy that you uh, that you stopped smoking. And he said, I have she said, I don't smell it. Over. And he went back and he looked at this product, this chemical he was working on, and took it to the manufacturers and said, this is an amazing thing. It actually encapsulates certain molecules. And they said, we're going to market this. And they went out and they couldn't sell it. How are you going to sell it? It says your house stinks. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they put an odor, uh, a, a smelling thing in Fabrice. And it's marketed as an air pressure, but that's not what it does. Yeah. Uh, that's some of that psychological stuff that we do to trick our brain. Awesome. Um, Terry Dale has a, well, actually, Jim Liebman said, only eat ice cream when you're reading the Bible. I thought that was. <laughs> it will work. <laughs> And Terry Dale said, isn't God's help required to change attitudes and behaviors? Say that again. I didn't get the verb. Um, isn't God's help required to change attitudes and behaviors? Wow, that, that's similar to a question. I, I, sh I should have expected that from Terry. <laughs> um, let me give you my belief on this. And that is that I think God has created an unbelievable creature in us. We, we, we can do so much good if we um, allow ourselves to do it. Now, whether that's God intervening or God creating my ability to do it. Um, and, and I think about these things that we know now um, about learning, like I think, I think God has given us the ability to develop some unbelievable uh, chemicals and vaccines 
to help us. Could God keep that virus from happening? Sure. Um, but I think God gave us the opportunity to develop and to become more than we are um, at any point in time. Um, that, 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 that we have, we can, we can have our own skills and, and to do things. There are times that we may have to go to college, uh, but, but we have some very simple techniques to intervene in our lives, in our own lives and in the lives of other people without having to go that way. I'm not. I'm not sure if Terry and I agree on that, but uh, but I'm not denying it. I'm just saying that that I don't think we have even come close to scratching the surface of what an unbelievable creature we are. And and the more we are aware of the things that we can do for ourselves, the, the better off we are. If, if that makes any sense. Great. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, one of the things that, that you said that I really appreciated was that self-awareness is so important. And um, John Calvin talked about, um, you can only know yourself as much as you know God, and you can only know God as much as you know yourself. So that interchange of, yes. of information is, is so important. And John Calvin even talked about that in his Institutes of Religion. Um, so we are at time and um, so very thankful, George, for your insights tonight. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, putting these things into practice because I've got some habits to break in 2021. <laughs> well, let me know if they work. I will. I will. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming. We appreciate it. Good night, Thanks, everybody. George. Thanks. Okay, Enjoyed it. Good seeing everybody.